Good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me OK. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us today from wherever you are for this webinar. Um, my thanks especially to the team at Landor for organising this series um, and also to iGlow, who are our sponsors today. Um, they are making this conversation possible. Um, and we will hear from their director, Dave Bragstaff, a little bit later in this session. A um, couple of practicalities before we begin. Our panellists are going to speak for about 30 minutes between them, um, and then hopefully we'll have about 45 minutes at the end for questions. Um, you should be able to see the Q&A button on your screen, I think. Um, so if you use that to type in your questions, they'll come directly to me, um, and then we will collate those and put them to the panel at the end. So feel free to, fit, um, to send in your questions as we're going along. Um, we have a hashtag today, of course, um, which is hashtag green transport recovery. So please feel free to tweet um, as you feel led. Um, and also the session is being recorded and it will be made available online afterwards. So whereas you are all muted and invisible at the moment, um, just be aware that your questions will be um, recorded if I read them out. And I suppose on the topic of being muted and invisible, um, I just want to reassure you that whereas we are physically scattered today, um, there's coming up about 150 of us at the moment on this call. So um, we are very much present together um, as a scattered community. So this webinar series has been curated in response to the Department for Transport's announcement of £250 million pounds, um, to cement cycling and walking habits. Um, so this is using infrastructure interventions and um, the idea is that this is going to be done at speed. So our topic today is making the most of contested public space for active modes. Um, we will probably, I think, use this as a bit of a guide, um, as a brief, um, but forgive us if we meander slightly off topic. Um, I th what I think is really useful about these webinars is seeing the expertise of the panel and also seeing how they interact with each other in conversation. So I hope that we'll be able to explore a few wider issues today as well. So who are we all? Um, I'm Becky Cox. Um, until recently, I was working for Living Streets as their principal technical advisor. Um, so my, my core interest, I suppose, remains walking as transport. Um, I'm also currently studying a PhD at Glasgow University. Um, so I'm, I'm not an engineer, not technically a planner. Um, I'm a bit of an urbanist, urbanist mongrel with an academic hat on, um, which is a curious visual image. <laughs> um, but I'm very much here to facilitate your learning today from our esteemed panel. Um, so we have Tom, Sally, Patrick and Dave. Um, I've got a fantastic range of expertise between them, um, everything from local authority officers right up the coalface through to academics, through to industry. So um, I really hope that we'll, we'll get a good conversation going. And so it's a great pleasure to be your chair today. Um, let's not pretend everything's easy at the moment. Let's not shy away from the difficult questions today. Um, uh, I'd really encourage you to, to make the most of having access to these, to these people. Um, so I am going to be quiet now and I'm going to pass over to Tom Cohen, um, who is our first speaker. Um, Tom is a senior lecturer at the University of Westminster, um, having joined the university in January 2020. Um, his work is divided between the newly formed Active Travel Academy, um, which you'll hopefully have come across, um, and teaching on the MSc Transport Planning and Management Programme. Um, he also spent 10 years formally as a transport consultant with Sphere Davis Gleave um, now Sphere. So I will hand over to him. Thanks very much, Becky, and good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mark. So having heard about the Active Travel Academy, let me do, people talk about shameless plugs. I'm feeling slightly sheepish. I'll describe this as a shameful plug. Active Travel Academy recently launched at the University of Westminster, where I'm pleased to be now. We're doing quite a lot. Um, hopefully you've heard about some of it. We have cycling at tea time now there. We recently launched walking at tea time. We have just launched an academic journal. We have a blog. We have a podcast. There's really no limit to our activities. And without wanting to over egg it, the Active Travel Academy is really all about building an effective bridge between the research community, campaigners and practitioners in active travel. So it is our job to help all those interested in these subjects to collaborate and to share knowledge. All right, enough plugging. So on to the subject matter. My feeling, a, a slight remove from practice, is that I'm hearing the word could and the word should an enormous amount. And 
this slightly worries me in the context of COVID-19 and what we were trying to do before COVID-19 broke. Uh, here's a quotation from a poll. The poll finds that 17% of commuters are more likely to cycle to work in light of the coronavirus outbreak. Now, if you listen to those words carefully, you will see how little a poll like that actually tells us. And I think there is a, a real risk at the moment that we who would love to see a massive increase in walking and cycling might start smoking our own dope. So that's one of the messages I have for us today. Let's try to resist that. Thanks, Mark. I guess that means that I am, for the purposes of today, the team pessimist, and it's therefore appropriate that I'm going first because subsequent speakers will be much more uplifting with their good news. And in being a pessimist, I, let me assure you, I really want to be wrong. I'd love to be wrong, but I see some serious grounds for concern. And this graph, which I put up, uh, probably uh, summarizes things quite well. This shows the number of cars registered in Great Britain over time. And you will see that by 2019, there were about 32 million in Great Britain, slightly more across the UK as a whole. And as and when things change as part of the lockdown, that's roughly how many cars there are going to be in the country, parked outside of people's houses and in their garages. And as we will come on to see, uh, they might have many reasons to drive them, but sunk cost is another. We're all susceptible to it. We've invested money in these things. They're there, they're beckoning to us. And there's no sign, as far as I'm aware, you can tell me if I'm wrong, of the government relenting on its massive road building program. So I suspect that whilst there's good news concerning the promotion of walking and cycling, the background is a worry in that, um, in addition to the fact that there are these major commitments to spend, there may even be some Keynesian thinking coming out in the wake of COVID-19 as we try to wrestle with the a recession that we've created, you know, to try to build ourselves out of the situation. Thanks, Mark. And then, of course, we must remember that the story at the national level is complicated, as this um, message tells us, if possible, walk, cycle, or go by car. Those are the three options that are being promoted at the moment, apart from obviously not traveling at all. I find the positioning of the icons in this image slightly unsettling, but I won't dwell on that. So someone who has a car is being told that they're justified in using their car in certain circumstances, and they may feel morally obliged even to do so because of the emergency. And so they might feel that they don't want space taken away from their capacity to drive. They have to drive. And that leads me to say that I think that this is, I'm not saying anything new here, both a, a real opportunity and a really big risk. And I think it's, it's a risk in the sense that getting it wrong could be very costly for the active travel community. Thanks, Mark. This is my second and last graph in a distinct color. Uh, these bar charts, I think, just demonstrate the brute facts of land use. So you see before you the mean commute trip distance in England over time. And as you can see, it's gone up and down, but it's about nine miles. And my impression is that despite COVID-19, meaning that lots of people might continue to work at home, I would imagine that the mean commute trip distance is probably not gonna change dramatically. And I don't need to tell you that nine miles is considerably further than most people consider reasonable to cycle, and it's an awful lot further than most people can walk. Maybe we'll see the electric bicycle breakthrough, but I think the underlying fact is that an awful lot of commute trips and other trips really aren't feasible by walking and cycling. Lots are, lots are. Thanks, Mark. Meanwhile, and I'm sure many of you have seen this as well, uh, there are the opportunists who are thinking of new or perhaps old ways of using the car. This is a drive-in cinema launching next month in outer London. And I'll just uh, share some nuggets from their FAQs. Question, can I bring a bike rather than a car? Answer, this is something we're working on and we hope to allow bikes in the future, but for now we cannot allow bikes due to safety restrictions. I mean, that sounds frivolous, but I think there's probably a serious underlying point. Elsewhere in the FAQs, this is a direct quotation, you're more than welcome to run your engine to preserve the battery. During a two hour film. So, what we're looking at is a situation where we're proposing to and actually taking space away from motorized traffic with good reason. 
we are telling people not to use public transport if they possibly can help it and greatly reducing its effective capacity and we're not doing an awful lot to restrain car use at the same time and i think that that combines into a troubling picture in that when we've attempted to price demand off through congestion in the past it hasn't gone terribly well it hardly sits well with the decarbonization agenda thanks mark I'd like now to turn to plastic. Now, plastic has a number of real advantages. It's relatively cheap. You can do things with it very quickly and it's easy to change. And its changeability actually is an interesting shortcoming, you could argue. I'm indebted to Mike Tisdale for this example from Deptford High Street, where the image on the left is some uh, footway widening, which was subsequently removed because vehicles were dislodging the hoardings that had been put up. So there's a feeling that there's a bit of more haste, less speed going on here, and that's entirely understandable given the rush in which things are being done. To some extent, certainly from my area in London, there's a sense that things are being done in the places where it's relatively easy to do it. And again, it's understandable. Another observation is that much of this stuff has been put up in quite a grand fashion, uh, creating some problems of severance, I think. And I did find myself likening one barricade to the re-emergence of trench warfare in that to cross the road now you really have to be prepared to clamber over something quite substantial thanks mark final slide and this is an image that many of you will also know uh, this is from new york and on the face of it it's quite similar you've got a before and half picture and in the after picture you've got some plaza created using temporary materials and paint so superficially quite similar, but I think there are some important differences. The first is um, context. So at the moment we're responding to a health emergency and this in New York was done on the basis of a much different agenda, um, overlaps, and I'll say more about that in a second. So if you imagine a Venn diagram which has COVID-19 on one side and decarbonization or whatever you prefer, sustainable development on the other, there is clearly a large intersection. The promotion of active modes is clearly in the center of that intersection. But those two are not coextensive. And I think it's important to bear that in mind. The second difference is one of aesthetics. And I've already said that things that have been done to aid footway widening haven't necessarily been very pretty. This looks okay, doesn't it? I mean, it may not be wonderful, but it's got a certain style to it, even if it is made with temporary materials. And I think the third and perhaps the most important difference is that this has been put there with the expectation of it becoming permanent. It is a trial that will lead to something probably made with stone. And again, it's not reasonable to expect the footway widening schemes to be equivalent because we don't necessarily know that they will be needed long term, but they don't look remotely permanent to me. So in conclusion, we have an opportunity and a risk in front of us. And I think if we want to reap the opportunity and manage the risk, we do need to think about aesthetics. And that may seem like a trivial point compared with everything else we're contending with, but I think it probably matters more than we realize. Making these interventions look as good as we possibly can is going to help, I think. Then mentioning the Venn diagram I talked about again, I think we need to concentrate on the bits that are in the intersection because those are the bits where we will be pursuing a decarbonization agenda at the same time as responding to the COVID-19 emergency and avoiding some of the possible criticisms that might arise if we were seen to be doing otherwise. And the final point is a very simple one and you've all heard it and you've all thought it, which is that we need to be ready for the backlash. And that means we need to work exceptionally hard on our communications. I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, some really interesting points there. Um, I always think it's it's a good idea to have a, a panel pessimist because <laughs> um, it's important to you know to get an insight into some of the real challenges of this. Um, I was I was drawing breath in a sort of <clears throat> kind of uh, watching some of the things that you were saying there. Um, there are some real questions around how we manage the short and long term impact of these infrastructure things. How do we how do we stop something that's pop up also therefore being popped down again? Um, and that's maybe something we can come back to later. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Sally Slade. Um, Sally is the team leader of the walking and cycling team at Leicester City Council. 
She manages Leicester City Council's Access Fund, um, and she also led on the production of their local cycling and walking infrastructure plan. Um, the team has grown exponentially um, since 2012 when Sally joined it, um, which I think is really um, credit to the success of Leicester's active travel programme. Um, I think they are they're a quietly impressive local authority doing a lot of things in the background. Um, Sally, unfortunately, um, is not able to, uh, we're not able to see her face today <laughs> um, because the firewall systems within the council have made that um, impossible, but um, hopefully we'll be able to hear you instead, Sally. Okay, hopefully. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our, oh, you can hear me, Becky, great. I'm going to going to tell you a little bit about our experience in Leicester. Um, so if you could move on to the next slide, please, Mark. Um, it all started really in Leicester on the Friday after we were sent home. Um, we normally hold a Cycle City workshop every month for stakeholders of cycling in the city. And so we held the first uh, workshop virtually. I wasn't there at that particular time, so I can't um, take any of the credit for this. Oh, could, could you go back a slide, please, Mark? Um, so we, we held the, the workshop virtually and um, we decided in, in the workshop that we needed to create some safer space for our key workers. And we also wanted to think of what we could do in terms of the bikes that we had sitting around that we knew we weren't going to be using for the next couple of weeks that we normally use for bikeability and adult cycle training and bike maintenance. Fortunately, our lead member was listening and was fully behind it. The highway team were brought on board and worked really quickly to get our first key worker corridor in, in place on Elston Road, which is the photograph in the picture there. And um, one of our main hospitals, the Leicester Royal Infirmary, is just behind the buildings at the back of the photo that you can see. Uh, before we knew it, the lovely Craig, our traffic management supervisor, had gone global. Uh, the pictures were going flying all around the world. And more importantly, uh, we knew that the cycleway was was being used. Um, we did some ad, ad hoc um, cycle counters by hastily turning some of the cameras onto it. And um, we knew that people were using. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. So uh, we then started to put a plan together based on our local cycling and walking infrastructure findings. Uh, and so we'd, we planned more key worker corridors, not just to the hospitals, and these are shown in green on the plan that you can see. Um, we also have um, quite a large food manufacturing um, base up in the northwest of the city in Beaumont Lees. Um, so we've got plans in place for um, more key worker corridors to um, for uh, staff to access them because they've been you know, exceedingly busy throughout the um, lockdown. Um, <clears throat> the red areas on the plan that you can see in front of us are uh, again based on our LC WIT findings. These are um, district centres that uh, we think have the most walkability um, elements to them um, uh, and that's based on the number of people that live in the area uh, and uh, within a 800 metre um, distance, walking distance of them, and the types of facilities that are in those areas. The orange lines are uh, where we're looking to close some roads off to create some more space for walking and cycling within the city centre. Um, and the yellow areas on the map are those um, cycle routes that we have uh, already. They're, they're um, painted with white lines, but they don't have any physical um, barriers so we're hoping to put some um, ones on those lanes as we go along to, to give a bit more um, secure cycling. Next slide please Mark. So for the next two weeks we worked on a transport recovery plan uh, and we called it creating space to travel safe and that was one of those moments at the kitchen table I've been working on for the last couple of weeks and my daughter heard what I was talking about and I'm very proud to say she came up with that title. Um, and we continued to um, install uh, more key worker corridors. This one is that you can see in the photograph is on London Road, uh, one of the, the main radar roads into the city centre. Uh, we um, kept people informed of what we were doing using uh, the variable 
were message signs. Uh, we've got very, very uh, once those dotted around the city, uh, and we also used social media to let them know what we were doing. Next slide, please, Mark. And so two weeks ago, we started on uh, widening of the footways in those shopping districts that I talked about. Um, Belgrave Road is otherwise known as the Golden Mile, and it's the heart of the Asian shopping district in Leicester. And throughout lockdown, it continued to be um, quite busy with pedestrian movements. We actually put this one in place first, despite worrying it would be controversial as we'd actually tried to take out um, a lane uh, a couple of years ago to widen the footway and install a, a cycleway, but it had been uh, met with that much resistance. We actually uh, abandoned the scheme in the end. Um, so we thought we'll give it a go with a temporary scheme. And actually we, we've had no resistance at all to it. Um, that one went in with no, no trouble at all. Queen's Road, however, uh, it, it's in a far more liberal area and we thought that scheme would, would be welcomed, um, but we were surprised. Well, there was some um, opposition to this, uh, I think particularly at, at some of the shopkeepers in the area and it hit front page news in, the, in our local newspaper. Um, but we're taking comfort in the fact that um, for every count negative post that's put on the local area Facebook page, uh, there are about eight times more positive views on that. Um, and so we, we're waiting to see what happens when the shops actually open, um, more of the shops open next week uh, uh, and whether um, actually more use of it um, helps calm things down. I, I think it has already started to calm down. And one of the things that we thought perhaps we had done wrong, lessons learned, um, Belgrave Road, we did manage to get in contact with some of the, the business organisations there. So they did know it was coming, but we didn't do that with Queen's Road. So I think in hindsight, that's probably something we should have done. Uh, and the other thing is that um, when we first put the cones out, uh, we hadn't got the uh, stencils, the pedestrian and safe distancing stencils in place. And I think, it, you know, people just weren't sure what, what um, they were being used for. And as Tom quite rightly said, when they first go in, it, it, it looks rather like it, it, it's a load of um, roadworks uh, just happens so people don't know how to use it. So as I say, we're, we're starting to put the, the stencils in place. And next slide, please, Mark. And uh, we've actually been in contact with um, a local graffiti company in Leicester. Uh, um, what we've asked them to do is to come up with some more fun alternatives to the pedestrian and safe distancing markers. Um, these are a, a selection of, of quite a number that, that were sent in. These are my favourites, not necessarily saying that they're the ones that are going to go in. But the idea is that we just want to make, as Thomas said, you know, um, when we first put these things in they do look like um, roadworks and they don't look very inviting um, so we want to put something in in place in terms of the stenciling to make it look more more attractive and um, we're, we're ordering in um, uh, trees at the moment uh, and some more greenery to try and make them a, a more attractive pedestrian space uh, we've got um, cycle hoops on order uh, in order to replace some of the cones um, with cycle parking to give um, not only cycle parking for those people that cycle to the area, but a bit more reassurance for people walking in the carriageway. Um, next slide, please, Mark. I think um, at the beginning I talked about um, the fact that uh, we we lo wanted to loan out bikes, the bikes that we weren't using. Uh, and so we created the Leicester Bike Aid and the free bike loan for key workers. We managed to cobble together about 50 bikes. We thought that would be plenty. Um, we were wrong. Uh, so far, we've had over 500 requests for bikes and we've given out 173. Um, and we're in the process of allocating another 80. And that's really been down to, you know, as I say, we only had 50 bikes that, that we thought we were going to give away in the first place. So, uh, you know, we've, we've had a, launched a social media campaign and um, we're, we're really surprised by the generosity of the general public in Leicester, who've uh, both general public, the police, local cycle shops and other local projects have so far donated 157 bikes to us um, and, and we're still getting bikes coming in. So, you know, we think that's been a massive success and 
And Jan, who you can see pictured on, on the right there, she did a, a calculation for me yesterday. Um, of all the participants that we've now given um, bikes to, uh, between them, they're cycling 1,177 miles a day. So in, in terms of congestion and um, air quality, you know, we just hope that they continue to, to carry on with that. Um, all the participants are given locks and lights. And uh, that second poster is um, we're, we're operating pop-up bike maintenance sessions um, for anybody. Um, so far, we've delivered 73 sessions and they've been in some of the bike shops that have stayed open in Esther, but also just in a lot of the neighborhoods where we've popped up a gazebo and, and, and taken a toolbox. And um, we've, we've maintained 462 bikes now, all have been checked. And we've got another 11 sessions booked in. And uh, for the, wheels, uh, the, the bike aid scheme, for those people that um, uh, have too far to travel by, uh, pedal bike or can't manage it by pedal bike we've been um, pushing them onto the wheels to work scheme and we have a, a number of electric bikes through that scheme that we've been offering out to um, to key workers so we, as a team really the walking and cycling, cycling team some of which shown in the picture on the right we've shifted from delivering events and activities in, in schools and businesses to delivering bikes and food parcels uh, and last week um, Jan and Max and Adam that in, pictured in there um, they were asked to deliver some birthday cars to a lady turning 100 so they turned up in vintage, on vintage bikes in full suffragette and Dick Van Dyke costumes and she loved it. Next slide please Mark. So we've also got team members that um, are staying at home uh, they've been busy creating new pages on our our travel and transport website called Choose How You Move. Um, uh, and this has been in response to traveling during lockdown to make sure that members of the public in Leicester and Leicestershire have all the information that they need to about traveling. Um, but we also um, have put a lot of information up there on uh, encouraging people to continue to walk and cycle in their local area where they can. Uh, in May, we normally hold a walking festival uh, and that's we, we have a series of led and guided walks that we put on. Um, so we replaced that this year uh, with putting lots and lots of routes to walk in your local area. Uh, some of those were linked to the Go Jauntly app uh, and we set walking challenges uh, in the city and asked people to send photographs in of, of them taking the walks and we've been posting them on social media. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. So our next steps really are we've we've provided the bikes, we've provided the bike lanes, or we are providing the bike lanes and the bike maintenance. We feel that the final key in the cog is to make sure that we've got safe bike parking um, for people when they get to the destination. Bike theft at uh, the hospitals was already an issue, unfortunately, and, and the last thing we want is um, for um, an NHS worker to, to finish a 12 hour shift and come out and find that their bike stolen. So uh, we're ordering or we're in the process of ordering three new um, secure cycle parking um, shelters for the hospitals. And we opened uh, our city centre bike park yesterday. Uh, that's pitched down in the bottom right hand corner, ready for retail shops opening next week. Um, uh, and we're also, as I said earlier, looking at, at bringing in bike parking to the local districts as well and um, trying to make them look more attractive because I absolutely agree with Tom at the moment. It, it does look a bit like um, uh, roadworks. Um, and then we're working with schools. We've been continuing to keep in touch with the schools and uh, looking at um, ways we can support them to travel back to school safely. So Strands on our behalf are in the process of carrying out um, a questionnaire with parents to find out how they would like to be um, taking their children to school once they start back at school. And we've um, we, the, we've not um, the the deadline date is the end of this week and um, we the last time I spoke to them we, we had over 700 responses and they were really encouraging responses um, you know people wanting to walk and cycle their children to school uh, and so we want to support the schools with uh, with play street orders and school keep clear zones and then finally we're, we're monitoring the effectiveness of of what we're doing you know uh, our 
are creating the key worker corridors, encouraging more cycling in those areas? Uh, are we um, enabling people to safely social distance in our shopping districts by um, putting the pop-ups in? So um, uh, we, we're working with our um, area traffic control cameras to, to just keep an eye on what's happening. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. Um, great to, to hear some of the, the practical responses that have been going on in Leicester. Um, and also that really important point about how we humanise some of this infrastructure um, so it doesn't feel too inhuman um, to people who are using it. How do we get the, the infrastructure itself to, to inform our potential users how they should be using the street? Um, again, maybe we can come back to that later. So I'm now going to hand over to Patrick Lingwood. Um, Patrick is Oxfordshire County Council's Active and Healthy Travel Officer. Um, he previously worked for a number of years as the Walking and Cycling Policy Officer at Bedfordshire County Council, so many years of experience in local authority, um, and also I think similarly heavily involved in the production of Oxford's um, LC Whip. So um, over to you, Patrick. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I will be talking about how Oxfordshire County Council is responding to the uh, um, guide, new guidance from government and the emergency uh, funding, but particularly looking at Oxford. And in a way, the Oxfordshire towns are much more compact compared to um, Leicester. So we have actually different issues, I think. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide then. So um, there are actually three issues within the uh, reallocating road space guidance. The first is to create social distancing. So we looked at all the locations within Oxford where it would be impossible or nearly impossible for people to socially distance. In fact, the, most of the problems are around the um, city centre of Oxford. Um, and actually there are three issues within the actual city centre. So that first inner circle is, is the, uh, the pedestrianised streets where really it's just the sheer numbers of people and cyclists within those pedestrianised streets, which is going to cause problems. Then the circle around that are the, the streets that lead into the pedestrianised streets, which are open to, well, mostly open to buses, but they have very narrow footways um, and there is really no extra space on the roadway. So that creates another issue of both people queuing at bus stops and the pedestrian flows going into and out of the city centre. And then finally, those smaller circles around the outside are, there are a number of pinch points coming into Oxford, either because of railway lines or rivers. Um, and once again, there's the issue of we've got narrow roads and relatively narrow footways. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of what our responses are, um, for the moment, we haven't really got a response for the numbers in the um, city centre streets. Um, we considered one-way flows, but really, we're not sure that would be really manageable and really help. Um, in terms of the bus stop queues, we're looking at to relocate bus stops into a number of streets where there aren't such um, intense pedestrian flows because there are a, another, a few other locations. Um, another issue is actually queues, pedestrian queues, creating at, signals, um, at signal crossings. So we're looking to change the signal timings at these crossings to give pedestrians more time um, or more or more changes for pedestrians. Um, once again, another issue is the, the narrow footways coming into the wider um, Oxford. That is a, quite a, it's a difficult issue. There are some locations where we can widen footways and cycle lanes. The others, um, really it's it's a difficult, difficult decision. We're not really, we haven't really got a, a, a solution for that. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. See if you are right, good. Um, another issue within the reallocated road space is to lock in the benefits of lower car use and more cycling. Um, but in fact, actually, there's been a kind of a different uh, outcome from Ox in Oxfordshire and Oxford. In Oxfordshire, um, on looking at the left-hand graph, there's been a huge increase in cycling, something that's at least double the cycling that you had in 2019, the blue being 2020. 
the majority of that could be termed leisure cycling, or at least non-commuter cycling. Whereas in Oxford, in contrast, everything is done because by about 60% cycling, walking and traffic, because the majority of cycling within Oxford is utility and uh, commuter cycling. So we don't, in Oxford, we don't have that. It's actually a lot, there are a lot fewer cyclists, unlike many of the Oxfordshire towns. Uh, next slide, please. One particular issue, which I spend a little bit of time, this affects Oxford in particular, is coping with the potential transfer from bus. Uh, as we saw, um, the government guidance says, don't use a bus or public transport unless you have to. This graph shows the, the top line is how people come into Oxford city centre from the nearest and the bottom line is from the furthest point of um, ward in Oxford. And as you can see, in, from the look at the top line, in Oxford city centre, they're mostly walking or by cycling. Then cycling kind of peaks about one, two miles away. Uh, and walking, really, it's quite difficult to walk that far beyond about one, two miles. And so cycling then declines. And basically, those journeys into the city centre are taken over by bus trips. So it's a kind of distance where it's quite far for cycling and there are a lot of hills in Oxford. It's, um, so what will happen? And in addition, there are all the trips coming in from outside Oxford as well, the park and ride trips, which are kind of about 6,000 park and ride trips coming into um, Oxford. Uh, next slide, please. So what does that mean? Um, around about 180,000 trips come in and out of Oxford city centre every day. Um, and about 95,000, about half of them are by bus. So this was pre-COVID-19. So what is, how are those people going to try to travel in the future? If the intention is to run the same number of buses in the future, but in keeping by government guidance, if they socially distance from the bus, we get a kind of only about 19, 20,000 people eventually coming by bus. If they transfer to car, it wouldn't be possible, but that would be a, you know, it would be an enormous problem of congestion and um, air pollution. The other only really viable option is they transfer to something like cycle or e-cycles. And you can see the scale of change between what's happening, currently happening, I mean, 22,000 cyclists, which is a, a lot of cyclists compared in many places, but to get to 92,000 cyclists or even something approaching that, that is really an enormous challenge. Uh, next slide, please. Just just to show you what would happen. Well, what happened the last time Oxford had a hundred thousand cars coming into its city centre? This is now the pedestrianised um, core market, full of people, full of shoppers. Um, this is what it like looked like in 1961 with a hundred thousand cars coming in into the city centre. So not in any way possible. Um, go on to the next slide, please. So what are our responses? Um, we've got £600,000 we're going to spend over the next eight weeks. Um, first, to put cycle parking in the city centre and also the district centres. We're putting in parking pedal at park and ride sites to encourage people to cycle in instead of going using the bus or in addition to using the bus. Um, we looked into bus lane reallocation. A lot of our street roads coming in Oxford have bus lanes. Um, but it really was not feasible because the same number of buses will be running. They need to stop at the bus stops. Um, we did ask the DFT whether we could put cycle logos in the bus lanes because that's not permitted. Um, but unfortunately, we got a negative response on that. Um, we have the advantage that we have laid out or have got in a draft a, a cycle network in the LC whip. Uh, so we're intending to sign all those routes we're refreshing the cycle lanes and at the same time intending as far as possible to widen them or in fact extend them in some cases. Um, an obvious one is the better maintenance of the cycle path. Um, the most perhaps controversial um, in the guidance is talking about modal filters. Uh, this has the advantage of creating low traffic neighbourhoods, but actually in the more immediate future, it could create what could be called cycle, start, cycle streets. Um, known as feet start, 
in Dutch. Um, so that's where you have a, a residential street, which is basically got very little traffic, um, but it's a cyclist take center, center place. And finally, we've had quite a number of uh, inquiries from e-scooter companies, and we expect that once the government permits e-scooters, that uh, e-scooter trials will be uh, very popular in, in Oxford and will give those people living at the edges of Oxford another, another viable choice other than cycling or recycling um, to come into Oxford. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, I think that's a particularly interesting insight for me into um, the differences, some of these, how, how some of these play out um, differently in terms of more urban areas and wider, sort of county wide areas, something like Oxfordshire, which has a huge variance in terms of the types of places we're trying to put these interventions in. Um, so I think if there are other people who have questions on that topic, it'd be interesting to hear them. Um, what are your particular local challenges in terms of delivering this infrastructure? Um, I'm now going to hand over to Dave Wagstaff, who is the director of iGlow, a um, particularly interesting company um, who manufacture glow-in-the-dark infrastructure um, and I believe um, established as a leader in developing state-of-the-art safety solutions um, for many sectors across the industry, um, including I think we saw some of them in use in one of um, Patrick's photographs just now. So uh, Dave is also unfortunately unable to share his face with us, but um, we should be able to hear you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Becky. Good morning to everybody out there. It's uh, Dave Wagstaff, as been mentioned, uh, from iGlow. We're based in the Northeast, uh, where we uh, carry out much of our R&D work, uh, also the design and uh, manufacturing of all the, the various products. Next slide, slide please, Mark. <clears throat> yes, the first question is, how is iGlow different to what's out there on the market? Uh, on the diagram there you can see a glass bead on the on the left hand side there that's coated with technology we developed uh, with a glow pigment so the idea is you coat or encapsulate the glass beads which are then used uh, in combination as almost like building blocks to develop the, uh, the aglo products so the idea is as you charge it in daylight um, basically the glass bead enables the UV to be transmitted through it it's able to charge up the uh, the glow pigment and energize it basically what then happens is in in subdued lighting light is released and transmitted through back through the glass beads to get uh, an afterglow hence the glow in the dark um, the intensity is maximized because of the combination of the uh, of the glass beads and it gives a very intense glow, which kind of is able to last throughout the night. Uh, the Aglo disc can be installed temporarily or permanently. Uh, temporary ones are either glued or can be a combination of glued and screwed. Permanent ones are, you see on the bottom there, there's a drill bit that are used in SDS drills. So the idea being that you create a recess, circular recess, uh, which houses the uh, the glow discs. Next slide, please. Yeah, basically during austerity, street lights were switched off, which saw uh, basically an increase in pedestrian and cyclist accidents and associated litigation. Uh, I glow discs facilitate safe travel for pedestrians and cyclists. So what we worked out is basically the lights are switched off at uh, midnight for a full year there's obviously millions saved in energy costs uh, but the reduction in carbon emissions was effectively one million tons per year and also as a reduce in uh, redu reduction in light pollution <clears throat> so glow disc can be a huge contribution to uh, decarbonate decarbonation of our cities and whilst the glow is bright enough for wayfinding and emergency incidents it's still enough to present no adverse effect to wildlife and no danger to bats. Next slide, please. 
Yeah, he can see on the left hand side all the various uh, discs that we do. We've developed a kind of printing process, which you can see in, in it's kind of combined into the, the glow system to give you a full range of signage. Um, basically, iGlow discs are an ideal method for temporary or, or permanent uh, navigation, as you mentioned earlier, <clears throat> cyclist and pedestrian. It's basically non-invasive technology, non-trip, non-slip, doesn't require the coating the entire pathway, which tends to deteriorate under traffic and weather. So for cyclists, uh, glow and reflective discs can be all incorporated. That's the, the, the ones at the top there. So the, they use for shared use uh, facilities. The iGlow cycle discs at the bottom there <clears throat> are used to navigate for segregated cycle paths. For pedestrians, uh, iGlow discs can be now spaced out every two meters uh, to create pedestrian pathways, but also for uh, inbuilt social distancing. The tactile discs, which are fourth down the list there, are stalled on one side of a pathway. Basically, it helps uh, the visually impaired uh, to basically to guide them along the pathway where there's no tactile cues available. The, the second one from the bottom is the social distancing disc that we now use uh, basically to remind pedestrians that to stay two meters apart. Next slide, please. As you can see, these are surface mounted science signage that we've developed over the years, uh, mainly for the visually impaired. So surface mounted signage has basically been developed to improve navigation for the visually impaired. The mats can be installed either permanently or temporarily. The delineator is the one at the white product at the top and the cycle one at the bottom there are installed to warn the visually impaired of cyclists on uh, shared access routes. Uh, the difference being to other products on the market that basically 90%, 95% of visually impaired people have uh, light dark perception. So what we do is the outer bars or the blisters on the uh, on the blister tactiles are infilled with eye glow and they're used to highlight the edges of cycle tracks or crossing points crossing points on roads to improve safety next slide please another one of our products uh, is uh, secure step which is an anti-slip uh, product that we do for all pedestrian and footways uh, basically a retrofit anti-slip solution which can be applied to any surface in order to prevent slips. The difference being aggregate is suspended throughout the whole depth of the product to provide slip resistance as it slowly wears away it re-exposes uh, fresh aggregate to maintain the uh, slip resistance. So basically secure step flows and cures into any surface and is resistant to peel and weathering so basically it, it won't peel off it's once it's uh, kind of cured into a surface, um, it, can, it, it can stay there for up to 20 years. So it's available in all colors, including reflective and glow. It can be formed into any shape from lines, such as step nosings, or basically two meter lines for social distancing or arrows or other signage. So the photos on the left are uh, for jobs we carried out in uh, Middlesbrough Town Centre where they had slippery uh, drain covers so we basically retrofitted the uh, black secure step and uh, that was over two years ago and there's been no further slip issues next slide please here's a, a job we did in i think it's one of the oxford jobs fairly recently basically shows you uh, the flexi tact surface mounted tactiles that we do uh, and that's incorporated with the iGlow disc. So basically what you, you have there is a safe zone crossing the road. Um, the outer blisters on the tactile shows you basically the, the kind of route to take across the actual uh, pavement itself. Next slide, please. This is the job we did fairly about six or seven months ago. It's one of the uh, schools in Northumberland who were looking to basically segregate uh, children going into, in, in, into primary school uh, to create safe pathways. So we installed the new cycle discs, uh, I think it was about uh, six or seven months ago now, 
which have worked really well in terms of guiding uh, the school children along safe areas of the, the playground and associated uh, kind of pathways to the school as well. So it kind of gives them a safe access route into the school. Next slide, please. This looks a bit uh, busy to say the least. It almost resembles a uh, Pac-Man Pac game from uh, yesteryear, from the, the dinosaur years for, the, for those that remember it. Uh, it's basically a proposed scheme for a pedestrianised zone in the town or city centre. So the idea is where roads are closed off, they, they can be used for cyclists, uh, basically segregate. So it's, a, it's the lines or the, the, uh, the kind of discs in blue there that gives the cyclist uh, two ways of uh, movement. Um, take off past over the, the, the green dots off for the pedestrians. So the idea is you have a central lane which is occupied for cyclists. And then the outer green areas, the green discs, if you like, uh, are for the pedestrians. So they're all spaced two metres apart. And then the offtake from the main kind of highways, if you like, are for access into shops. It's a one way approach on either side. Um, for the visually impaired, they can uh, cross over the, uh, the kind of main uh, kind of cycle paths. So there's if you like the, the kind of uh, beige areas there are the tactile air, tactile areas which allow them to cross over at uh, regular intervals so this is just a proposition uh, the idea being that we we work with uh, councils the design teams and the architects to develop different systems depending on the uh, configuration of uh, town centers next slide please Yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, there's uh, just a number of references there at the end from uh, Oxford uh, City Council, Joanna Mellon. Uh, basically, over the last three or four months, we've installed three or four different uh, cycle routes uh, with really positive feedback. Uh, Camus Primary School, again, we developed a segregated uh, cycle route there. And Middlesbrough Council, over two years ago now, we did um, a lot of retrofitting in terms of the anti slip strips to prevent further slips. I think that's everything now. Thank you very much and uh, all the best. Bye now. Thank you ever so much, Dave. Um, really interesting to see what the more technological solutions are to some of the, um, the challenges at the moment. Um, we've actually got um, a very last minute uh, additional panellist um, who is Councillor Kai Dudd uh, from Bristol City Council. Uh, he's cabinet member for transport energy and the new green deal so he's going to speak to us um just very briefly in a moment um, i'm actually just we've got one uh question that's just come in for dave and um, so i'm just going to ask that very briefly uh, whilst we're loading the additional slide um, this is a question from chris watts um, for you dave and it's do you have any examples of the use of reflector discs for green corridor routes um, such as the national cycling network um, canal towpaths, etc., that are funded by local authorities or the Canal and River Trust. We haven't actually done any work for the uh, canals and river trusts. Um, the, the kind of the reflective combined with the glow uh, discs, if you like, was a fairly new product we developed about six months ago. So um, I think we uh, all the cycle routes now that we've done with Oxford uh, contain the uh, the kind of combined uh, reflective and glow. Uh, which have been really well received. So yeah, we <clears throat> we haven't actually done any work as yet with any of the canal routes, but uh, yeah, it'd be great to do some trial works then. Great, thank you. Um, so I think we are now ready to hand over to Councillor Dudd. Are you there? Yes. How, how are you? How are you? Thank you for joining us today. Um, yeah, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, sorry, I think there's a bit, a little bit of uh, confusion about my my attendance today, so apologize apologize about that. Um, I'm just on here to um, obviously talk about how we, how we're responding to the uh, COVID-19 situation. In I do just have I only have one slide, just as a as a as a talking point, really. Don't know if you can um, put that up, Becky, if if, if, if possible. Um, but what we what the approach we've taken in Bristol is um, we've looked at um, what plans we already had, uh, maybe plans that are medium term, long term plans that we're looking at over the next five to ten years, say, and we've looked to see what we could bring forward um, uh, as an intervention 
in terms of uh, an, an immediate intervention. So um, what we've done in Bristol is we've decided to bring forward the pedestrianisation of the old city area of Bristol. Um, if you've been to Bristol before, you, you'll be familiar with, with that area. Um, I do have a, a map of uh, uh, the area there. OK, right. Um, I think that's a little bit, um, has that been zoomed into a little bit? There? I think so. I don't know uh, what's happened there. Um, but what, what we're proposing to do is pedestrianise the, the old city area, which is Broad Street, Small Street, Corn Street, the area highlighted in blue there. Um, we're also looking at um, two, uh, in effect, bus gates on Bristol Bridge and um, at the other end of Baldwin Street. Now, what that does um, and the effect of that is to take the through traffic out of the centre of Bristol. Um, so you'll still be able to access um, everywhere that you normally access in the city centre, although it may, it may take you a little bit longer if you're, if you're in a car. But the, the um, intention of our actions was to take free traffic out. Now, what that does in terms of the Bristol Bridge intervention is it frees up a lot more space for um, uh, pop-up cycling lanes. And also, obviously, it provides that extra pr priority for, for buses in the, in, in, the, in the city. Obviously, the advice around public transport is um, obviously clear and sometimes confusing from government. Um, but the reality is that um, even though public transport in the city has dropped off massively, it will have to come back and we, ha we have to um, support public transport going forward in buses. And um, the, more, the more cars we take off the road, the more people on public transport, the more road space there is also for other uh, sustainable transport me measures to, to, to take place. So that intervention has allowed us to um, introduce we're in the process of introducing new cycle lanes, segregated cycle lanes across the city centre to the south of that image there, and also um, Lewins Mead in the north of that image up through Stokes Croft. Um, we, we are also um, looking at um, other areas outside of the city centre, the sort of low traffic neighbourhood approach. Um, we've trialled something similar before in Bristol, um, but uh, my, my view is that um, with interventions like that in, into neighbourhoods, there needs to be time for proper consultation and engagement with, with those neighbourhoods. So we, so we are going to look at that in a phase two of our interventions in, in terms of our response to COVID-19. But I think that's a piece of work that we need to take some proper consideration with and take on people's views and introduce that by bringing communities and neighbourhoods with us. Um, the advantage of bringing forward plans that we've already already worked on are obviously quite clear. Um, a lot of the cycling interventions are um, work that we've already done on the local cycling walk-in infrastructure plan that hasn't been signed off yet by the combined authority. But we're looking to bring as many of those interventions that were in the uh, LC WIP forward uh, to um, quickly as possible. Um, some of the barriers that we face are obviously capacity. Um, we do have a limited amount of capacity in, in, in terms of officer time within the council. So we're prioritising what measures we can bring forward quickly. Although there is a huge public demand for, as I said, major, uh, measures in neighbourhoods. Um, people want us to go further. Um, but at the moment, we have to deliver what we've already announced. And then we can look at other measures with, within phase two. We also have... We've got the usual resistance from some of the business owners with, within that uh, central area. Uh, a lot of the views are sort of um, based on not fully understanding the, the, the scheme that we're bringing forward. So as I said, access will still be maintained. It's just through traffic. But we, we've got the usual stories in the press about this is going to be the final nail in the coffin of uh, retail and things like that. But obviously, many of you will know that all the evidence points to the fact that increased pedestrianisation obviously drives more footfall to, to an area. It's good for business. And a lot of the be businesses in that area, cafes, pubs, bars, restaurants, and they're the kind of businesses that would, would benefit from, from, from our interventions. So I'll leave it there. Sorry, it was a quick five minutes, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for, for joining us today. Um, it's really interesting to hear the political perspective on this as well. Um,
obviously that that's that's normally the really important phase in delivering any of this infrastructure is the um is the political buy-in and um, so really exciting to hear that you're you know you're here to speak to us about that today um i'm going to go to some of the questions now um please do keep sending questions in we've got um, a good selection so far so if i can invite the panelists well there's actually not many of us who can appear but <laughs> those of us who can appear um one of the questions that has come in um it's coming from a few different people in a few different forms um this particular one is uh, tony waterston um it's specifically for sally um but equally i might i might hand it out to the rest of the panel as well um which is this question of cooperating with local residents um, particularly over selecting streets um, and rat runs for partial closure and filtering because I, I think we're seeing two different types of intervention here we're seeing stuff at the neighborhood level um which is much more about um uh, these these um low neighborhood low traffic neighborhood treatments um, which is to stopping the rat running of vehicles and that's making the residential streets much safer for people to use um, and then we're perhaps seeing a slightly different approach on these main sort of key worker corridors um, which are perhaps much more about the pop-up cycle lanes and um, extending the footways and things like this. So I think there's a real question here about um, the extent to which we are, uh, you, you know, you as local authorities and politicians at the moment are able to take the time to consult with local people. And so this, this question says, have you had opposition so far? Um, are you able to collaborate with local campaign groups over where to put the schemes in? Um, and I think there was there was a related question. I'm just trying to find it here from um, uh, Robert Marshall as well, um, asking about the political support support for these schemes um, over how road space allocation was achieved and did you get political buy-in? So lots of different questions within that question. Um, I'll start with you, Sally, if that's okay, and then we might pass on to another panelist afterwards. We've still got Sally. Oh, can you oh. hear me? Yeah, 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 we've got you now. Thank you. Okay, Becky, I'm not sure I heard all of the question because I, I, I kept dipping in and out. I think it I think it was um about whether we had political buy-in. Political buy-in and also the extent to which you're able to um consult with local campaign groups and local residents at the moment. Um, the, the trade-off between needing to do this yeah. fast um, and needing to get the buy-in. Okay, so if I start with uh, political buy-in, um, yeah, we're, we're very lucky in, in Leicester, um, our lead member and indeed our, our city mayor um, have always been very much behind um, cycling and walking infrastructure uh, and so have really enabled us to Put a lot of this this pop of infrastructure in 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 a very short space of time. Um, you know they they were committing funds to it um, before we knew whether we'd get any any funding from the emergency fund. Um, in terms of um, keeping in contact with stakeholders, um, again I think I mentioned it in my um, presentation that we have um, a Sacker City workshop um, that normally occur pre-COVID uh, occurred um, once a month uh, and we all met in, in a meeting room. Um, actually, we've we've moved this to virtually meeting uh, and we meet every week um, at the moment, every Friday. Um, and so um, we're able to keep in contact with our stakeholders in terms of cycling. There's an element in terms of a, a, a trade-off between making sure that we get the infrastructure uh, in place as quickly as possible to respond to the um, the, the shift in transport um, and, and spending too much time consulting with um, stakeholders. Um, but uh, I think again, as I, I mentioned in the um, presentation, I think we, uh, the, the, the key worker corridors have gone in um, without too much controversy you know it, it is a case of coning or, or winding um lengths of road and particularly lengths of road where we've got bus corridors that aren't being used at the moment so um it hasn't caused too many issues um where we did have issues uh, and i think we've, we're having to be very careful is um when we're putting the um the widening in the footway around the district areas uh and and as i said um i think it is we've learned our lesson with Queen's Road that we didn't consult with any of the um, 
shopkeepers and I think now we we have had conversations with them they're a lot more amenable to what we're doing I think it was just a shock of, of finding um, cones outside their shop um, first thing in the morning um, you know we, we, we're talking with them and working with them about um, where we can have disabled parking um, facilities and where they can load and unload so I think in terms of um, the the shopping districts it's, it's it's really key to try and get hold of people and we're, we're putting notice because we could you know there's obviously not always somebody in the shop at the moment so we're putting notices up on um, our latest schemes um, and in terms of you know with the our, our war councillors in some areas have been um, very on board with these schemes and um, have taken it upon themselves to to start talking to community groups and about how the community groups can perhaps come out and and help in terms of um, where we where we might be putting planters and and greenery to soften the areas where the community groups um, you know if they're feeling comfortable enough to come out and and do some of the maintenance for us. So it's just potentially a really interesting um, opportunity to involve all these different groups, isn't it? Um, it's a great way to get wider buy-in if we can involve community groups in the, you know, the installation and the upkeep of some of these, um, what we're terming temporary measures, um, which hopefully will be less temporary. Um, oh, we've got another question here um, on that topic um, from Mike Walter. Um, I'm going to throw the panel in at the deep end. Um, I might start with Tom for this one. Um, how confident are each of you that these temporary measures being introduced in recent weeks will become permanent um, once brackets if social distancing is ever relaxed? Which obviously is the big question at the moment. Um, I'd be very interested in your thoughts. Okay, well, I'll try to manage my pessimism. <laughs> I think the answer probably relies on the extent to which there is a justification for anything remaining in that at some future point we think it may not be necessary for people to be two meters apart from each other and so footways won't have to be as wide as they're being made for that reason there might be other reasons for wanting the footways to be wider and to do with quite other things than COVID-19 and so it's going to be a matter of whether that argument can be made and I suppose whether people will have adjusted to the changed circumstances created by the temporary measures. I think it's going to be an awful lot easier for things to become permanent where there is a longer term argument in favour of doing it. And so it's not just a matter of trying to persuade people that they've managed to endure it up to now, but that it's actually a good thing in a wider sense. Interesting, yeah. And, and Patrick, can I put that same question to you as well? Um, from your perspective, what, how do you how do you feel we should be going about this to give it the best chance of becoming permanent in the, in the longer term? Well, as far as possible, the schemes we're putting in, we are looking for the future and basically that they will lock in the benefits and that they will um, that will stay, such as the increase of cycle parking, the refresh of cycle lanes, extension. So, as far as possible, we're thinking that way. Um, I suppose the most uh, controversial will be the question of uh, um, modal filters um, and that's where we have, a, or we already have actually, uh, or not, we've just um, publicised or um, plans to bring in quite uh, innovative and um, far-reaching modal filters throughout the town in the, in the kind of in the way of Ghent, but uh, it's a difficult question in a sense because we we would like to kind of have a lot of you know basically do a lot of uh, consultation and discussion so um, and in terms of local modal filters there are, there's a groundswell of support among um, lots of groups we've probably got eight groups in each different boards asking for modal filters but once again it's also a difficult decision because you the ideally would be consulting so those Possibly those modal filters will be, well, they'll probably be, if they're going to be introduced, they'll be introduced as emergency um, traffic regulation orders. And then we'll see how well they perform and how well the local people. So it's a, there are, so most of what we're trying to do is going to be, we're intending to permanent. Some things it's going to have to see really what happens in the, um, in the near future and how it is, uh, 
how it's received by the, by the local population. I think there's a, there's a big thing around the wording that we're using at the moment as well. Um, yeah, so the extent to which we're using the terms temporary and the terms pop up, um, which perhaps gives us impression of it being something a bit more temporary. Um, and I think there's a, there's a real need, isn't there, to be able to equip councillors and local authority officers and everybody else whose job it is to make the case that this is actually, there's a much longer term need for this, you know, that the need for this infrastructure isn't new, it's just that the situation has changed um, and has suddenly brought it to the fore, um, much more so. Um, there's a question here from Anna Semlin, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, what is the panellists' views of a 20 mile an hour national emergency built up limit, um, replacing the 30 mile an hour limits that we tend to have at the moment? Um, so uh, doctors want this to lower the baseline load on the NHS. So what are your views on a, on a perhaps a more blanket um, yeah, intervention like that that would perhaps therefore become a bit more permanent in its own right? Um, I, I will perhaps put that to Patrick again initially. Uh, well, Oxford already had um, a, a blanket 20 mile per limit on all the residential roads. Um, within the LC RIP, it, it, we are it considered introducing 20 mile per hour on some of the, the main roads, the main roads within Oxford, um, because in fact, probably unlike some places, I remember 80% of our cycle journeys are actually on our main roads, on the on the eight main roads coming into um, Oxford. Uh, so that's another question, discussion. I think that's in discussion. Um, Outside, I think right outside Oxford, um, in, in it, uh, Oxfordshire Times also, this, this is a discussion going on. Um, it won't be in the first phase, That's um, with, it will be, we'll be looking at it further in the second phase to understand more issues. But I think, yes, it's as a blanket, I mean, I would say yes, in a way, if the government were to say that at least all residential roads in, the, in urban areas would come ready, that would be a, a very positive um, step. and. I don't see really much kind of uh, uh, backlash to that idea. Thank you. Um, and perhaps, um, Councillor Dad, if you're still with us, um, perhaps the same question to you as well, um, from your perspective as a as a councillor in this, um, what would be your thoughts on a, a blanket 20 mile an hour national limit? I think again, we're probably I'm I'm in the same position as Oxford that on our residential roads we've we've done that. So I think the message back to people listening is that your council's already got to, the power to introduce that if they if that's something they want to do. So whether or not it should be national, um, maybe it should be. But um, I think we've we've taken that action in in Bristol. Um, the problem recently is people aren't, haven't been sticking to the speed limits, so it doesn't doesn't really matter what they speed limit is there's been some very bad driving recently on um the roads given the fact that they're more empty so that's sort of an enforcement matter that we've been working on with the police so i think they're great great to have in residential areas but um the, the question about enforcement then then becomes more more relevant because it's you know council with limited resources it's very hard to have somebody on every, every corner watching uh, how people are driving yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, there's, a, there's, there's definitely a, there's, there's a couple of questions here coming in about monitoring, and um, I understand that there was a I think there was a, web, a webinar previously on the topic, so uh, much of that has probably been been covered already. But we might perhaps touch on that very briefly. Um, the importance both of enforcement at the moment, um, you know, all of these new infrastructural interventions that we're bringing in to some extent might need enforcement or at least a, a watchful eye over them just to make sure that they're being used um, as intended. Um, but then there's, a, there's perhaps a separate question which is about how we monitor um, the usage of these new infrastructure interventions, how we understand what the changing picture is of how people are moving around, um, how we monitor where we perhaps might need to roll these interventions out in the future. Um, I'm just trying to find a question that was relating to this. Um, there's a question from Emma Coburn, um, which is uh, where experimental traffic regulation orders are being used to implement pop-up measures. There's concern in some circles that current circumstances mean that the usual monitoring required for this type of traffic order can't be done. 
um, often not able to define the before situation. So uh, what are the panellists' thoughts on monitoring regimes required um, beyond measuring their success in enabling social distancing? And I suppose this is a particularly interesting question for me. Um, I'm attached to um, a research centre called the Urban Big Data Centre, um, and we've been doing a bit of looking at pavement widths and how we measure um, how much of a network is um, appropriate for um, social distancing at the moment. So there's, there's a really interesting opportunity to take some data here. Um, perhaps, Tom, if I could hand that question to you. Um, a general question about monitoring at the moment, what, what data we can take and what's useful um, in terms of not really being able to have that before scenario, um, but being able to capture the, the during and the after. Sure. Well, this is very topical because I was talking about this only yesterday with regard to my home borough of Islington. Yes, in a perfect world, you would have a baseline against which to compare current circumstances and use that to assess the impact of an intervention. That's the gold standard. And there's generally an expectation of a control group too, so that you can see what background changes might have happened anyway. If that's not possible, you don't give up. I think there are alternatives and some of the participants will be aware of work that's been done by my colleague Rachel Aldred and co, where intercept surveys are used to gather how people have responded to an intervention. It's not as robust as the hard numbers of traffic counts, but maybe you can combine these things into something that will be certainly better than nothing. But something else that's possible is to use the fact that these interventions tend to have a staged rollout to gather data in multiple places and compare therefore untreated area A against treated area B. Again, not gold standard, but better than nothing in terms of understanding impact. It's interesting, yeah. I think it's it's very difficult in these situations because they're, they're so complex to understand the um, how much of this is behavioral and how much is, um, you know, it's related to people's habits and how much is the new infrastructure. So that there's a really fascinating opportunity to, um, you know, to, to, to measure and to observe what's going on at the moment. Um, and hopefully, I'd, I, would, I would hope to be able to make that useful um, and fully available to local authorities to use in, in future. So even if the, you know, if the worst comes to the worst, even if the infrastructure at the moment doesn't remain permanent, um, it may be that the learning from this can remain permanent. Um, I'm aware that we are very close to time, if not slightly over. So I'm just going to um, ask one more question, uh, which is a relatively contained one, um, which is for you, Dave. Um, it's from Helen Blood, and it is how are technology providers being engaged as they can support but cannot always get a seat at the table? Sorry, I lost lost you halfway through that uh, question. Um, it is how are technology providers being engaged as they can support but cannot always get a seat at the table? Yes, it's it's, uh, it's a good point, uh, Becky. Um, we're obviously working with a, a number of councils, not a lot, but quite a few, obviously with a kind of new new kind of development in, in technologies uh, for our kind of R&D line. Um, yeah, it's uh, it would be good to almost uh, have that contact with design teams because um, obviously based in England, we're, we're developing um, products specifically for uh, use in terms of um, cyclist and pedestrian signage, if you like, for kind of temporary and permanent situations. So it's been good to learn exactly what uh, people are actually saying out, you know, kind of involved in the infrastructure uh, and the traffic rates and monitoring. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a question of obviously being access to, to individuals to kind of work with them uh, to develop systems where we can look at traffic rates and cycle rates uh, and looking at the best solutions for particular configurations of, uh, of city centres. Sure, so obviously a really important um, role for bringing together lots of different expertise at the moment and perhaps thinking outside our, our usual circles that we might, we might go to for, um, for information. So I think at this point um, I'm going to bring us to a close. Um, thank you ever so much to each of our panellists who have been with us today. Um, as for Dad has had to go to another call, but it's been, um, as ever, we've never got enough time to discuss these issues, but um, there is, I believe, the... 
next webinar in this series is happening soon. Um, if you go onto the Landor um, homepage, then you can see the events there. Um, there have been loads more questions coming in, and my apologies to those who I haven't managed to get to. Um, there is a whole a whole challenge of questions actually on the implications of the Equality Act and um, the inclusive design of infrastructure and how we do that at speed. And that's obviously such a it's such a huge question, so it's such a pressing question at the moment that I, we wouldn't have done it justice today. But um, though I, I understand that that is being talked about in other circles, and it's certainly one to keep on the table. So uh, yes, say so thank you very much again to Landor and to our sponsors iGlo, um, and thank you for me. Um, hopefully, you can join us again for the um, the next webinar.